And so we are talking about wisdom. And um, we could see that when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he gave them the Ten Commandments and the law has their wisdom. That was their wisdom. That was their ability. He said, so long as they walk by that law that he had given unto them, no matter how he experienced the nations of Canaan were in warfare, he said they could not withstand them. And um, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30 tells us that God has made Jesus our wisdom. He has made him our ability. Therefore, we can boldly say we have ability to do anything we want to do. You have ability to become whatever you want to become in life. Amen. Are you with me, yeah? You have ability to prosper, ability to be in health, ability to live as long as you want to live. How? Because God made you, God made Jesus' ability unto you. So the Christian does not lack for ability. And that's the reason why we don't have to pray like other people who don't know that they have ability. Some people are praying for long life. Some people are praying for financial prosperity. They don't know they have ability. Are you here with me? God made Jesus' ability unto you. And that's why I told us that from the beginning, financial prosperity does not come with prayer. It does not come with fasting. It comes with simple obedience. God says, give that thing to somebody and you don't want to give it. That means you are preventing your prosperity. Are you with me, eh? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Yes, Hallelujah. Yes, I know that mighty men are merging in this place in Jesus' name. Yes, are you here with me? Yes, okay, so today we want to talk about the seven pillars of wisdom. Seven pillars. Seven pillars. Pillars means mighty, well, you know, sustaining with sustaining structures and we already know that wisdom is ability and the word of god is wisdom amen, amen. that's why john said in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god and the word was made flesh so jesus who has been made wisdom unto us was the word of god before he came into this world and that is why when you walk by the word of God, there is nothing you cannot achieve in your life. Absolutely nothing. No reason to be agitated and to be afraid. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So God made Jesus our wisdom and Jesus is the word of God. So, we want to talk about the seven pillars of wisdom. That means that the seven pillars of wisdom could be seven basic things. Very basic and indispensable that God wants you to know about his word. Since wisdom is the word of God. Seven basic things. Columns. Bulwarks. Weight sustaining structures. Pillars. You know, this house is... We are conveniently on the second floor of this house because we know that this house has a good number of pillars sustaining it. So we are not afraid of it being collapsing upon us. That is the same way these seven pillars of wisdom will make you to be mighty. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And so let's turn to Proverbs. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs 9, seven pillars of wisdom. It's been on the net, on, your, on the social media, WhatsApp and Facebook, if you were following up. And I encourage every one of you to follow up, right? So that when we come together, you will have an idea of what we're going to talk on. And maybe you've done some meditation on your own too and some revelation has come your way. So that we can only be heard into that one. Or the Holy Ghost will build upon what you already have. Because the Bible says to him that has, will more be given. You already have. God more will be given to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe that, stand up, shout a big amen. amen. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go to Proverbs 9. We are going to read from verse 1. Proverbs 9, verse 1. It goes, it said, wisdom has built a house. You will build your house. 
In fact, you're already building your house. Amen. He said, wisdom, that means the word of God, has already built a house. She had hand out her seven pillars. That means that there are seven mighty pillars in the house that the word of God has built. Those seven mighty pillars are the ones sustaining the house of God. And we need to know them. And when these seven pillars become a part of your life, you become certain in life. Okay? You become certain in life. You know that there will be no fear in your life. No fear of premature death. No fear of failure. No fear of accident. The other day I was traveling. I got to use the bus. And uh, when we got on board, somebody was praying. And as usual, I want to close my eyes to enjoy the prayer. But at the time, the guy was flashing the blood of Jesus so much that I was afraid. It might enter into my eyes. He said, we, said, we sprinkled the blood of Jesus on the road for, against all the blood-sucking demons. And I thought that he had already seen the blood-sucking demons against all the trap the Satan has set on the road for us. And uh, at the time, the prayer was going in a way that I couldn't be affirming it again. I had to keep my eyes open. Another day I was driving. I was coming from Bielsa. And um, that was some years ago. And uh, as I was coming on the road, I saw some students, you know, some couples standing, and I was driving alone. I said, okay, let me just carry them so that I'll have company. I think I picked them somewhere out there. Yes, I picked them from out there. And as we entered, I entered back to the road again, my speed was not too low. And the guy was looking at the way I was driving. Observing at the time he burst into prayer, he said, All the blood sucking demons, all the spirits of accidents. And I said, Okay, I'm the spirit of accident. I accelerated more again. The more I accelerated, the more the guy prayed. Hallelujah. And I was enjoying it anyway. Anyway, I don't drive like that again. Amen. Eh? Now, if I'm going on the road, I'm very careful, right? Uh -huh. Hallelujah. So, you know, the Bible says all those fears are just unnecessary in your life. Fear of poverty, fear of failure. God, I pray that I must be rich, uh, no matter what. No, those prayers are not necessary. Because the Bible says that wisdom has builded her house. That wisdom is the word of God. Because the Bible says that God has made Jesus wisdom unto us. And um, before Jesus became human being, he was the word of God. That means that in the word of God is everything you could ever desire in life. All you need to do is to make sure that your life conforms to the word of God. And things will be happening for you. Okay? Can match somebody shout a big amen. amen. Now, you said, okay, so I want somebody to rise on your feet. Let's take this verse with together. Now, take it after me. Wisdom had built a house. She has hand out her seven pillars. So we want to discover what the seven pillars are, right? Let's go to verse 2, and I, I just want us to enjoy verse 2 first. Go to verse 2. He said, she had killed that beast. Take it after me. She had killed that beast. She had, killed her beast. She had mingled her wine. She had, her wine. She had also furnished her table. She had also furnished her and you've been invited to the table. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now, okay, so let's go there. Yeah, I want you to... Now, so the Bible says here that wisdom has built a house and she has earned out her seven pillars. And today we want to look at the seven pillars that are sustaining the house that wisdom has built. And we already said it sufficiently that wisdom simply means the word of God. Because the Bible says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh. So before Jesus entered into the world, he was the word of God that entered into the world. So if we say that wisdom has built a house, the Bible is simply talking about, you know, uh, the word of God, the completeness of the word of God. And she said, the Bible says that she has end out her seven pillars. The word seven is, the, the number seven is a perfect number. It's a perfect number. That means it's complete. In other words, what God is saying is that the word of God is now complete. Are you with me here? Yeah? Yes. It's now complete. For example, the other day I was praying and the Lord told me that he's, he's raising up seven millionaires for me in the church here. Amen. And, uh, you know, uh, um, 
And I, I said, Lord, he said, yes, I'm raising up seven millionaires for you here. And um, I was thinking that there was going to be seven physical persons who were going to be millionaires. But then, no, that's not what he means. He said, look, he said, look, everybody that takes by the word of God and walks by it is going to become mighty in this place. Amen. Nobody will make boast of money around you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I believe what God told me. So now let's go back to verse 1 again. So you need to take these seven pillars very well in your life or strongly believe in them, practice them in your life, uh, memorize them and walk in the reality of them. And there is no weight you cannot carry in life. You become the weight bearer in your family, the weight bearer in your village, yeah. in Port Harcourt City. A lot of people are saying, no, there is no way in Port Harcourt City. There is a way. There is a way. Turn to somebody, tell that person, there is a way. Amen. Amen. You can't be defeated in this city. Hmm? Hallelujah. As I look at you, I see people whom God is blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. And you are increasing whether Satan likes it or not, right? The Bible says the Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That means there will be obstacles, hindrances. But the Lord has certainly prepared a table before you. Oh, hallelujah. So now we want to look at the seven pillars. Now, pillar one, let's go to Genesis 1. Number one pillar. Number one thing that we need to know about what God has done is that uh, we need to know who God is. Because Genesis 1 verse 26, let's go to Genesis 1 verse 26. Genesis 1 verse 26 tells us that, And God said, Let us make men in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the head, and over every creeping thing that creeped upon the head. Now here the Bible says that God is talking about making man in his own image. And uh, uh, he said the man he created is to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that creeps upon the head. That means that God, God's original purpose in creating man was to give him dominion, right? Now, but you see, God said, he said, God said, let us make man in our image. So number one pillar that we need to know is that we need to know who God is. Who is this man that created man in his own image and likeness? Now, until you have the right picture about yourself, you will not know who you have. In some parts of the world, some people believe that, you know, when they have children, and if any of the children is not disfigured, that means their God has not, will not bless them. And so, consciously, they have to disfigure their children. That was the practice in some parts of India. If a child is disabled, they believe that, that then that will bring blessings of God. So they either make the child, they will make the child to be deformed. That is the impression of who God is to them. Some people think that when they look at the sun and nod their head on the ground, and that is what God wants them to do. So a person's idea or a person's concept of God, you know, forms the basis of who the person is. If you know that your God is a loving God, is a, you know, is a caring God, then you become a loving person and a caring person. If you know that your God is the generous God, then you become a generous person. If you know that your God is the stingy God, you know, some people just look at God and he is not releasing enough. And that makes them, that's the way they behave. Hallelujah. So, what does the Bible say? God said, let us make man in our image. So, first thing is that if we have to understand who man is or who you have, we must understand who God is and who is God. Now, let's go to Genesis 2. Before we'll come back here so that we will understand who God is, we know him. You know, the, in the Bible says that even the animals in the forest know, have the consciousness that there is God. So having that consciousness that there is God is not enough. You have to know him. Now, are you with me here? Are you with me here? Hallelujah. Okay. Now look at, now look at verse 4. Verse 4. Or uh, let's read from verse 1. Or uh, let's read from verse 1 to verse 4. And he said, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God handed his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works which he had made. You see, you are entering into a period of rest in your life. Amen. 
you no longer be struggling for anything in life. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And these are the things that will make you to live a rested life. A life that you know that you are making your way no matter the circumstances. You, you know, because that's the kind of life God wants us to live. To be leaders. He said, let them have dominion. And you know, verse 2 says, And on the seventh day God ended the work which he had made. Seven again here. That means seven is a period of entering into rest. Perfect rest. And that is why when these seven pillars of wisdom become real to you, you will enter into rest in your life you never thought could have ever been possible in your life. Yes. Are you with me here? Yes. Oh, you will not be praying some kind of prayers. God, I want to sleep and wake up in the night. And you know, somebody slept and woke up the following morning and said, God, I thank you because I woke up all my children, my wife, my husband, everybody is alive. Those selfish prayers. Oh, many people are sick in the hospital. I'm happy today. And you, know, you meet those people who are sick and in the hospital, those who are dead. God is happy that they are dead. No, he's not happy. He's not happy. He does not want us to be selfish in life. Those prayers are actually prayers of selfishness. Being narrow, parochial. We are not seeing the broad picture God wants us to see. And so long as you are praying those prayers, one day those problems will come your way. Job every day was praying. Every day the children had their birthday and they celebrated because he was a great man and the children had enough to eat and celebrate. After every celebration, Job will take some animal to God. He said, God, please, I don't know whether my children have committed any sin. Look at the blood and forgive them. He was praying like that. God said, okay. Job's prayer. Job is not... You see, the Bible says Job was a righteous man. But he was not having, you know, that intimate fellowship God wanted him to have with him. That means Job was not rested. When those problems started happening, you know, the children dying, wealth going and everything. You know what Job said? He said, hey, the thing I feared most has come upon me. Why? Because he was not... He said, I was not at rest yet. People found me. But we are entered into rest. Are you following me? Are you following me? Hallelujah. That's what the Bible said. On the seventh day, God ended his work and he made his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day. That's why I'm taking time to share the seven pillars with you. Seven pillars in the word of God that will make you mighty, formidable. You become like you become you become like an ocean liner. You can't enter into creeks again. You become mighty, right? Yes, and you are just going your way. You are not turning back for anything. You turn back for no Satan. I show you there is a mighty place for you in this city. Amen. Not only in this city. Listen, listen. They are not only in this city. Beyond the borders of this city. Amen. If you believe that stand up, shout a big amen. amen. Ooh, hallelujah. Amen. I said you have entered into rest in your life. Amen. And this rest is becoming more and more real to you. Amen. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now verse 3. Let's go to verse 3. Verse 3. Verse 3 says, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, means set it apart, because that in, that in heat he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Verse 4. Verse 4. And these are the generations of the heavens, of the, of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord made the heavens and the earth, I want somebody to take verse 4 with me and take it louder than I do. These are the generations, are the generations of the heavens, of the heavens and, of the earth and of the earth when they were created, they were created. In, the in the day that the Lord God made, God made the, earth, the, earth the earth and the heavens. And the now, let's look at something here. I want you to know something here now. He said, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were made, when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven. And remember, we're talking about knowing the Father, knowing who God is. Now, now you see, in, the, in Genesis, the Bible says, in the beginning, the Bible says that God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God said, let us make man in our own image. So we were only hearing the word God. Now, that word God is not specif specified to Jehovah God himself. 
that word God is Elohim. Elohim is the plural form of the word God in the Hebrew. And it simply means that word can be applied to anybody that is occupying office, a high, a high office, like a judge, a magistrate, a king. Okay? So that word is not specified to, you know, it's not specified to God alone. For example, anybody that is occupying authority, can, that word can be applied to. That's why in the book of Psalms, the Bible says that, I said you are gods. In fact, in that place, the word was even applied to human beings. Jesus said you are gods. It simply means that you are people with dignity, with authority. And that is the reason why. Okay? So, but now it says here, it said, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God. Now, what makes this particular God we are talking about different from every other God is the word Lord there. Now, this word Lord is taken from the word Jehovah. And Jehovah means the one who exists by himself, who has the ability to bring into being whatever he wants to bring into being. Now, the difference between we and Jehovah God is that we are created gods. We are people created in his own image and likeness, in his own, in his own class. Mm. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but in his case, nobody created him. He lives by himself. The ability to live is on his own. So now, what the Bible is saying is that, is that in the day, the self-existent one who has the ability to bring into being whatsoever he wants to bring into being, made the head and the heavens. So what the God we are talking about is the one that created the whole universe that we are talking about. We are not talking about that one that somebody has in a hidden corner in the room. We are not talking about that one that somebody puts in the hand that this is my God in the name of one church. We're not talking about that one speak, that uh, man that, you know, the picture is there and, you know, when you get inside there. No, no, we're not talking about that one. Now, listen, the moment you confine to yourself to these ones that are made, even the ones that are made by God, that means you've begun to underprice. Underprice means the value. That means you've come down from your exalted place to a lower place. And that was the sin that Adam committed. God created men. He said, man, I'm creating you. I'm putting you in my own class. In other words, she said, now, I'm giving you the whole head. I give you dominion. Whatsoever you say is final. Oh, and now your word is becoming that. Whatsoever you say becomes final in your life. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And then Adam now listened to Satan, then had handed over the world to Satan. Why? Adam on that demeaned himself. He brought down himself from that exalted place where Jehovah God had put him to a lower place. And that was the beginning of the, the, the human problem. And it's still happening today. Some people have put themselves under sickness, under lack, under disease. You know, one thing, or you know, uh, in my family, nobody lives long. Nobody lives even up to 50 years. Oh, I don't know. Uh, in my family, nobody. You're bringing down yourself under that cloud. But what does the Bible say? In the day that Jehovah God, the one who exists by himself, the Elohim, the majesty, the judge, the king, the only one that lives by himself, made the heavens and the earth. So we are talking about the only one that lives by himself. Who brings him into being whatsoever he desires to bring into being? We've known him. And that is the reason why we refuse to bow down to any other being. Yeah. Are you with me, yeah? yeah? We refuse to bow down to malaria. Yeah. We refuse to bow down to typhoid. Yeah. Mm. Are you with me, yeah? yeah? We refuse to bow down to poverty. Yeah. You know, growing up in the village back then, in, you know, as a little child, I had this one. This, he was about my age. Or I, maybe I'm a few months, days older than him. Or he, he's, he's a pastor even now in Portaco City here. Yeah. Once in a while we visit. When we're growing up, I was bigger than him, but each time he comes my way, I will dread him. Why? Because he was a fighter. And you know me, I was not that... At the time, you know, I discovered that I don't have to be too gentle. So when I got into secondary school, I even re earned reputation as a fighter. But back then in the primary school, it was not like that. In fact, there was one of his brothers, the same father with him. That one, if I see him, I begin to run. Even though... <laughs> Hallelujah! But this particular one, I like him. Bigger boys will come to intimidate him. But Labara, 
or David as we call him will not accept. He will fight his way through. He will fight his way through. He will not cry going to the mother. Mommy, no, hey, no. David will fight his way through. He was small. Okay? But he will fight his way through. He said there are some things you know in your life that enable you to fight your way through. You, you can't just accept that authority again. It doesn't be, that word does not become final in your life. The way the doctor gives you can't become final in your life again. Am I talking to somebody? You see, the doctor's discovery is according to the senses. He's done something. He's tried. Some people say hey, the doctor is telling a lie. He's not telling a lie. He's telling you what he found. The doctor is not telling you a lie. That, oh, uh, the other day I was talking to somebody and she said, um, uh, is the doctor that knows what he's saying that way. But if you didn't believe him, why did you go to the doctor? In the first place, he went to him and he told you what he discovered. But listen, now if um, I'm owing somebody 5,000 naira and suddenly you send me 10,000 naira, that moment I am no longer a debtor to that person I'm owing. In fact, before that time, when I want to pass by that person, and you know, the other day I was going to somewhere with one of my friends, he said, he said Let's not pass this way, let's pass the other way. So let's pass the other way. And I said, no, this road is short. I know, Pastor, I know why I'm telling you. Let's pass the other way. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Then um, we got to meet our friend. And when we're coming back again. The friend said we should still pass the other way. So the friend asked him, he said, why? He said, I'm owing that lady 2,000 naira. He said, is that the reason? And so the friend brought the 2,000 naira and paid for the money. And when we're going to pay the money, you know, my friend now walked like this. <laughs> Because he knew that already the ability to walk straight before that person had come his way. Yes. Okay? You, malaria had been defeating you. Cancer had been defeating you. The mention of cancer has always, you know, my typhoid has been defeating you. The mention of cancer has almost put you into the wardrobe. Now when you know who you are, am I talking to somebody here? No. Oh, your inner man will rise. And as your inner man is rising now, you will go before the doorpost of that man and say, where is that man? It, the, the truth of divine healing. Sometimes it be sick and you go through pains. So when he started practicing divine healing, he said, okay, next time, when malaria, oh no, you didn't have malaria. He said, when pains come my way, I will, I will resist it. And he said he would wait until actually pain came his way. And then he would use the word of God to resist it. And then he came to that place where he came to know that he does not have to wait for pain or so sickness to come his way. That he can keep sickness off him. Am I talking to somebody here? That's where you are coming to. And that's where you are. You are already in need. The senses are bankrupt. Now what I mean the senses is the physical body because the physical body is dead without the senses. Your five senses are the means by which your body is alive. If the five senses are removed from you, the physical body is dead. The, body, the person has been buried in the, most, in the cemetery there, lying in the mortuary there. Are people who have lost their five senses. So the doctor's finding is according to the five senses. But when you realize who you are, oh boy, then you withdraw from your greater account to take care of the account of the physical. Yes, sir. Are you with me, yeah? Yes, and so that is what the Bible is saying. He said in that day, so in the day that the Lord God, the self-existent God, made the heavens and the earth. So first we've seen that God is the self-existent one. We are not worshipping the physical ones. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you with me yet? Yeah? That's number one thing. So many things to know about him, but you know, for the sake of time, we are not going to discover, we are not going to talk about all of them. And now let's look at uh, another thing that Jesus said about the Father. This one was even from the God himself. I want you to see these things for yourself. So that you would benefit. Let's go to John, John chapter 4. John 4, John 4, John 4. Gospel of John chapter 4. Thank God we have some Johns, so or at least one John in the house that I know very well. Hmm? If I had the name like that, I wouldn't play with that kind of person. I read that person's gospel until it becomes a part of my life, even in my dreams. And I like the gospel of John. Okay? Okay. 
So let's go to John 4. Did I say John 4? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, um, let's look at verse 20. John 4, verse 20. John 4, verse 20 uh, is a woman talking now. He said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. Ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, this woman was a quarrelsome woman. No, no wonder she'd been married to five men. Jesus told her that she's been married to five men. Here was Jesus talking to her gently, but she was so quarrelsome. She said that our fathers worshipped in the mountain, and yet said that this is the place where men ought to worship. Now go to verse 21. 21. And um, he said, Jesus said unto her woman, Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall eat neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Now note what Jesus called God the Father. Verse 22. Verse 22, he said, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Verse 23, But Baal cometh, and now he is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now verse 24, I want somebody to rise on your feet and take verse 24 with me. Uh, now, take it after me. God is a spirit, God is a spirit. and they that worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Take it after me again. God is a spirit and they that, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now you may be seated. Now you can see that Jesus is talking about God here and the first thing he called God is Father. Now so we discovered that this Jehovah God who created the whole universe, who has the ability to bring into being whatsoever he desires to bring into being, the self-existent one, is a father. Are you with me here? Yeah? Yes, he is a father. He wants you to see him as a father. Because Jesus called him the father. And then he said that God is a spirit. He said God is a spirit. That means that God is not a physical human being. And he said, they that one must worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. It means that he's not a physical human being. And he said that they that must worship him. He said, those people that must worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So now we discover that Jehovah God, that means the self-existent uh, king of the eternal king. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. You see, a lot of people have not come to really know God as king. He is king eternal. You may not see him, but he is there. And that will do you very well. That will make you to obey the laws of God. When I talk about the laws of God, the word of God. For example, if I'm passing by the policeman, I don't have to throw something on the ground because I don't know what, you know, he might arrest me for, you know, um, for littering the place. So when I'm passing by a policeman, I have to be very careful. If I'm driving, and I was driving anyhow, and when I get to a policeman, I have to make sure that my driving is neat. Why? Because that policeman is watching me. If I did anything, not, anything that does not conform to the law, I could be arrested. But you know, the God we're talking about is the self-existent one. Whether you see him or not, he's seeing you. And the Bible says, law is with you unto the end of the world. Now, he's with you under the end of the world does not mean that he's there to observe every mistake you do. No, that's not why he's there. He wants to be in fellowship with you. He wants to provide for you. He wants to give you ideas. He wants to be talking to you. Right? So, you see, the Bible says that the self-existent God that we are talking about is the Father. And he is not a physical being like my Father who is at a local environment right now that I could not see him. Now, but this God we are talking about cannot be localized. The spirit. Am I talking to somebody else? So now the basic thing we have to know about the father is that, or the basic things we have to know about the father is that he is self-existent and that he is a father and that he is a spirit. Wherever you are, he is there with you. In your house, he is there with you. Okay? You have to know that very well. He is a spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I left the house for service this morning before it was uh, you know, about 10 minutes or uh, thereabout to 6. And as I was walking down the road with my son, 
to where we could get Keke to cross the bridge. He said, Daddy, we are the only ones walking on the road. And I knew that he had some measure of fear inside him. I said, yes, we are, the, we are not the only ones walking. He said, but we are not seeing anybody. I said, because they will come out at due time too. But he said, no, we are not seeing them. We are the only. I said, no, we are not the only ones walking. God is with us here. And he said, yes, God is with us here, but we are, I'm not seeing him. We are not, I said, yes, that's why he is God, that you don't need to see him. And that's the problem a lot of people have. Them that contain the Ten Commandments of God. And then the glory of God was resting upon that hack. But Balaam tried to catch them. The more he tried, he couldn't catch them. You know what finally Balaam said? He said, there is a shout of a king among them. Oh boy, that king was not physically seen. But Balaam was perceiving the spirit of the king. He perceived by his spirit that there was a shout of a king. Oh, can you imagine? Even the Israelites who were there in the congregation did not know that Jehovah God was there with them. But a prophet outside them could see that a king was among them. And he said there was a shout of a king. Oh boy, wherever you are, this one that is a spirit who exists by himself, he is with you. Am I talking to somebody here? He is with you, no reason for fear. No reason for fear of malaria. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So first thing you have to know is that God is a spirit, right? The self-existent one who is the father and is the spirit. And John 3.16 tells us that he so loved the world. He said God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That means that God loves the world. No wonder First John chapter 4 verse 8 says that God is love. This God we are talking about is love. Love means I pride. Now it's not that when a man will see a lady that he likes, you know, he likes pictures and he says, I love you. No. That one is not the one that the Bible is talking about here. This one is I prize in giving you your value. Your value. You know, a lot of a lot of times people undervalue you. They undervalue you. They don't give you your prize. Oh, go, 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 go. Are you with me, yeah? Yes, sir. They don't give you your prize. Family, this is the problem that is running. Nobody ever prospers in that family. And I see that what happened to your great-grandfather is about to happen to you. That, that means that that person is not prizing you well. He's underprizing you. He's not giving you your real value. Are you with me, yeah? In my family, everybody suffers from BP. That person is not prizing you well. He's not giving you the real value. Love means to give you the value. God values you. He esteems you. He prizes you. How does he prize you? He said, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, God was not talking about the physical universe today. He was talking about the human race. He so loved the human race. That means he's so esteemed. He's so prized. The human race was so... Im no, he's not even talking about the human race. He's talking about you in person. You are so important to read that he gave his only begotten son for you. So your value... Am I talking to somebody here? Eh? So your, your value in the sight of God is the value of his son. Now listen. Um, if I bought the no, okay, actually somebody bought this phone for me and it was with some good sum of money bought it for me. Now each time I pick up this phone to use, I am not seeing the phone itself. I'm seeing the amount of money that was put into buying that phone for me. So the value of that phone to me is the value of money that the person who bought the phone for me put in buying it for me. So when, when the Bible says God is love, that means that God is high prizing. Am I talking to somebody here? Yes. He, he does not demean you. He talks you that. He gives you your own value. He tells you that you are bigger than malaria. He tells you that, look, I have given birth to you. He tells you that my nature is inside you. Now, oh boy.